You're listening to. Whoa! Hot luck. Hot luck. And welcome to another edition of Books and Boba, the book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. I'm one of your hosts, Marvin Yu, and I'm Ri Ra Yu, and we're here to discuss the book pick for February. Um, even though it's March already, um, it was a short month, so yeah, gotta gotta give people extra time <laughs> to finish their books. And this book was um, it actually took me a little bit longer to read this book than 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 normal it, it, was, it was a little longer than our uh usual books it's like 370 pages right yeah yeah and also you know it was a different type of you know we went from a, a breezy ya to kind of a more um not difficult but more uh intricate i don't know the, the yeah. right word um i mean the prose is a little bit more yeah like higher level in difficulty but um yeah, but for the month of February, we read Sorcerer to the Crown by Zen Cho. Yeah, and um, that's your cue for those of you who haven't read the book yet. Um, please go read it and come back and um, listen to us talk about it. And if you have anything to add to the discussion, um, please join our Goodreads page um, on goodreads.com. We discuss all of our monthly picks as well as... It's like random book recommendations and book news. Yeah. All right, so um, let's get to it. I guess the blurb for this book is, When England's sorcerer royal dies in mysterious circumstances, his adoptive black son Zacharias reluctantly takes his place in the society of unnatural philosophers, much to the outrage of the organization's racially prejudiced members. The timing is terrible. England's magical resources are dwindling. The country is embroiled in a war with France. Zacharias must contend with an overreaching government assassination attempts, and most unexpectedly, a biracial Indian woman who wishes to escape her malicious magical school and enter society. So it's like Pride and Prejudice meets Harry Potter meets, I don't know, the Obama presidency. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. It, it did remind me quite a bit of the Obama presidency. We'll get, we'll get into it <laughs> uh, as we like go further along in the discussion. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I guess we just start with um, general impressions. I really like this book. <laughs> like, I I expected it to be a lot more um, more dense in mm -hmm. its fantasy lore, simply because it was like speculative fantasy set right. in like a historical setting. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to be expecting a lot of historical background and a lot of. Um, <laughs> Just like a lot of like theories on how magic works because right. it just from like the book jacket's description. By the way, what Marvin just read is not the book jacket description. That's it's Rira's blurb. Like she gave the book it to jacket me. description was really long, and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna <laughs> rewrite it. Um, but just from the description, um, I knew that the magic would be more scientific, more steampunk, I guess. Okay, like more like. More alchemy than magic, so I expected more, right? More scientific backing on it. Well, the book is a alternate history England or Europe, um, taking place during the Regency era. Yeah, so early eighteen hundreds. So that's you know just right after the um, American and French revolutions. Um, mm -hmm. England is at war with Napoleon. Yep. And in this world, magic has always been a part of the world, like. The governments know about it. Yeah, yeah. Of... It's not like Harry Potter where where the muggles are <laughs> like they, they don't know anything about the Ministry of Magic magic or anything like that. Right. I guess so when I first started reading the book, I didn't realize how much it was taking place in, during that time. And and like personally I'm not a big it's not that I'm not a big Jane Austen fan. I've never read Jane Austen. So You haven't been exposed to the The closest thing I've done or I've, the closest thing i've consumed is pride and prejudice and zombies the movie shame on you <laughs> so i'm think i don't know i feel like i got the vibe of the thing it's not the same i mean you should you should read Snooty at least british people you, you know, should read at least one austin novel in your lifetime let's just say i'm not um well versed in the world of 
Jane Austen's Regency era fiction? Well, um, I'm not a super Austen uh, expert, but <laughs> I did get quite um, the Regency feel from the book. I was like, whoa, even the prose, it's very Austen-y. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of like very fancy words. Yeah, I was like, oh, wow, like all of the British people are talking so British. <laughs> <laughs> Like super Regency British society talk. And I'm like, yeah. wow, that's pretty accurate. Zen Cho did a pretty great job uh, nailing the dialogue on that. Yeah, I really liked the book too. Um, my first impression, my, my, my first impression upon finishing was like, that was a pretty good story. I, I, I thought, I didn't know it was part of a series. I, oh, me I, neither. I thought it was just like, oh, it's a standalone book. And, you know, it's pretty good. The, the, the book, the story ends with a new status quo. Um, and all the characters were a lot of fun. It was kind of fun to see um, magic, like British snootiness, like like you no know, British nobility culture, but also translated to like the magical world where like you also had snooty like dragons and yeah. fairies and things like that. I mean, one thing that I really, really loved about Sorcerer's Heart Crown was um, I read a lot of fantasy books where... Um, they're kind of set in, like, not exactly the Regency era, but, like, periods where it's, like, colonization, like, right. colonial period. And usually people of color, they're barely mentioned or they're just erased from the narrative. So uh, when I was reading Sorcerer to the Crown, I was like, wow, you have, like, you have a <laughs> black dude as the protagonist. And, like, that's pretty awesome. And, like, the the female... Um, the female, not sidekick, I would say Prunella is she's like equally the, the, the a female lead. Like yeah, the, the female lead. Yeah. Like, she's she's kick-ass too. So I was like, whoa, yay. Like, this book was pretty much uh, everything I wanted in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And it nailed it. Cool. So uh, let's get to the discussion then. Uh, where do you want to start? Um, I would probably start with the world. Let's start with the world. The world, okay. Because it's super complicated. If like <laughs> I remember um like at our book club meeting in uh in LA, mm -hmm. uh we had some people who didn't finish the book. Like some people read maybe halfway or uh they were like Well, this was our first book where well not our first book where people didn't finish, but people where people actually said they couldn't get into it. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was pretty uh <laughs> I mean I can see why people were yeah. hesitant to go into it because the prose is a little bit intimidating if mm. you're not used to that kind of like uh, hoity-toity British <laughs> prose. But um, but I feel like it it moved. Like I I didn't feel like it really like there wasn't any part in the book where I feel like it lied. Yeah, yeah. Like I would say like you would have to just get past page eighty. And then the mm. story really picks up because, right. like, the first 80 pages is introducing... Uh, it's world building, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. like, introducing Zacharias and Prunella. Prunella doesn't even come in until, like, chapter three. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a lot of introduction to the world. And unlike Harry Potter, where you have Harry, who doesn't know anything about magic, and you're learning expo exposition through, uh, right. He's through like his your surrogate, perspective... Right. Uh, we don't have that in Sorcerer to the Crown. Yeah, we get jumped straight in. Um, our main character is already like the highest, like he's pretty much president of wizards in England. Yeah, pretty much. The Sorcerer Royal. Um, and we learn that everyone hates him. Except for his... Like, I his wonder one. why. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we were, we're introduced to him in the prologue, I guess his adopted father. Like, So he's a... He's a black man with white adoptive parents, mm -hmm. um, and basically his adopted father trained him to be really good at magic, and like um, pretty much forced the um, the wizarding world or the magical world to like accept him as as a wizard, right? Like, yeah, the, the, that's the whole... like that's like the gist of of his situation. I mean, there's <laughs> obviously more to it, and we'll get to it, but. Um... Yeah, I just wanted to start off with the world. So, yeah. uh, like we said, magic is common knowledge to mm -hmm. non-magical folks and magical folks. Um, in Britain, there is the Society of Unnatural Philosophers. Mm -hmm. And the head, per the head person, the figurehead of 
this organization is Sorcerer Royale, and yeah. they're kind of autonomous. They're able to make decisions on their own. They're kind of separate from the government, but not right. really because politics. And <laughs> um, that's where Zacharias is. He's Sorcerer Royale. Yeah, so he's pretty much like the president of wizards. He's like he oversees. Doesn't really go into all his duties, but I guess he oversees policy, right? Yeah, is, yeah. is what I understand. Like um, policies, and uh, they have not not sorcerers because sorcerers are the highest level of magicians, right? So yeah, let's. Um, so in this world, there are different levels of like different of tiers. Magic. Yeah. yeah. So you have not Tra- even like you, you have lower class. Class is a big deal, and oh, as we've yeah. seen in like, if you watched yeah. Pride and Prejudice, you would know that <laughs> class plays a big deal in Regency era. So there are a lot of magic users from the lower class um, um, that use magic to you know to do their daily chores, so like sweeping the floors or cooking food, things yeah, like that. Yeah, and a lot of them are women. Yeah, yeah, um, and then we go. And then once you one get into the above. yeah, one step above, we have uh, magicians, right? Yeah, like traveling magicians. Yeah, magicians are people with magical power, but not necessarily um, a noble. Yeah, like, uh, not a, a not not brother. like academically trained. Yeah, yeah, they didn't. They're like self learned. They yeah. didn't go to school for for learning their magic. <laughs> and then you, and then on top of that, you have um, the thama- thaumaturgs. Yeah, the thaumaturges. Yeah, uh, who. Are accepted into society. They get funding. They do research. A lot of playtime with magic and yeah, they're experimentations. Like, and it seemed to me that the, um, the you have to be of like of a certain birth in order to make. Oh, it to you this have far. to be yeah. noble. Like yeah. you have to be from like a rich house, a land only family, or like yeah. yeah, like old money. And then, and then, like we said, the top tier is uh, sorcerers. The sorcerers who are thaumaturges who also have a familiar. Yeah, and a familiar is just, uh, just kind of like a mythical creature companion. Yeah, kind of like a Pokemon, only like right. think dragons and fairies and. Yeah, so in this world, there is also a magical world called Fairyland. Um, and if you are able to get one of the fairies, which can be a dragon or a mermaid or like. It can be anything, just yeah. like any like magical creature. To like follow you, like enter into contract with you, then you're considered a sorcerer because only only the highest like only the most skilled magicians or wizards are supposed to like be able to um to have a familiar. Yeah, because uh we learn later on in the book that uh this contract that sorcerers have with familiars, it requires uh Let's just say a lot of a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> it requires it's a, it's a bargain. It, yeah, it is a bargain. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's literally selling your soul. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but uh, Fairyland, since we mentioned it, uh, Fairyland is kind of like an alternate dimension that's overlaid on top of our world. Right. So, like, there are gateways from different countries. Into Fairyland, yeah, it's it's pretty much like a pocket dimension. Yeah. It's a whole nother, just another plane of of um, existence. Yeah, and in Fairyland, uh, they kind of loan their magic out to other countries because magic, too much magic, makes all the Fairyland creatures insane. Like, yeah, it's like crack. I yeah, guess. it's like crack. Yeah. So they, you know, deal to other yeah. countries. <laughs> Um, so Fairyland, yeah, Fairyland is the is the source of all magic, and all countries um, source their magic from Fairyland. They're given like their their allotment, I guess, um, yeah. or it, it's allowed to flow freely through through the gates. Yeah. And <clears throat> on that note, there are other countries that practice magic too, and every country apparently has their own philosophy on how magic is best harnessed, or what it's meant to do. So, or know, who can practice magic? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, during the course of the story where um, the French magicians are alluded to, the, the sorciers. Yeah, the sorciers. Um, we were introduced to a sect of witches from Malaysia. Mm-hmm. And also we are introduced to a wizard from China. Yeah. Yeah. Also who, flies around, s- who flies around in the Nimbus cloud. Oh, yeah. Like total Dragon Ball Z right there. <laughs> um, also a sorceress from India. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... Magic is very different depending on what culture you're from. Yeah, um, but we're talking about England. 
in the Regency area. So obviously, men only. You know, yeah. women should not be, unless you're of a serv of the servant class. Then then women can use magic to serve their betters. But if you're a woman of noble birth, you shouldn't you shouldn't um, burden yourself with the with the strains of magic because you yeah. know the the poor female body can't handle it. Yeah, we we talked about this at uh, at both book club meetings. We had a yeah. Google Hangout and we had a live club live book club meeting and. Uh, I had mentioned how in the Regency era, it's probably the most stratified <laughs> class era. And the reason, the only reason why uh, women of a lower class are able to get away with using magic is because that they're poor. There's yeah. only a certain uh, level that they can get at in life. And uh, it's not a threat if they use magic to like kind of move up the ladder because there's only so much room right. uh, up there. But then with rich noble women if they have magic then they're kind of equal to uh right. their rich white male counterparts it's like um i mean the real world analog would be would have been what education yeah right? education science yeah yeah i mean we see this in history like women are barred from opportunities right. because they pose as a threat also um like one of our book club members mentioned how magic can be kind of considered a metaphor for sexuality because mm -hmm. um like it's okay if a woman is magical as long as they keep their magic private and at home as long as they don't show it off well we are talking about regency era england which is oh yeah also super repressed and oh yeah like women could not own property like everything went to yeah. like the sons and their husbands even though if I remember correctly, like most of the women in like those Jane Austen novels, weren't they really horny? There were, there were they were at just least really man crazy, right? There were there were at least like one or two, like sex crazed. I mean, characters. They all, well, they all wanted husbands. I guess well, that's not the same as horny. But then that that makes sense though, because you want to have a husband that will take care of you, because otherwise, like you're a woman and you're not married, you have that's no true. money, you have no property, you have no way to get a career because women aren't allowed to have jobs other than <laughs> being a governess or or like a maid so yeah yeah it's like being married was kind of like going to college for for guys that's true um but yeah we're we're at the beginning of the novel we're we're told that england is low on its magic yeah something happened uh, magic isn't flowing from fairyland. No one's checked on why or asked why. Um, they just assume it's the black guy's fault. Yeah, which is <laughs> which was like really funny to me because uh, because Zacharias's adoptive father, Sir Stephen Wright, mm -hmm. he um, like he's praised as like the best sorcerer royale right. in like in like history, and I'm like. Wait, but all of these problems existed when he was Sorcerer Royale. It's not like magic, um, like like magic was in abundance. It was yeah. still being drained. And and as soon as Zacharias becomes uh, Sorcerer Royale, they're like, "Oh, this is your fault." <laughs> and it, I don't know. It just like brought so many flashbacks of like our country and like our <laughs> politics right now. I think I don't know. I don't, I don't know when this book. This book was written like twenty fifteen. Yeah, 2015. So maybe some of it was, you know, a little tongue-in-cheek. Um, I mean, the author is Malaysian-British, so... Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, politics happen everywhere. Right. I mean. um, and so, I guess that... Anything you want to talk about? Anything else about the setting? Or should we move on to... We should probably uh, move on to uh, Zacharias. Yeah. So characters. Um, so Zacharias' wife is our main character the um the first black not only the first black member of the of the society of natural philosophers but the first black like sorcerer royal yeah, yeah right and he came to power because he took it pretty much like he like he his um his adoptive father passed away and then he ended up with the staff which is i guess it's like the the sword and the stone it, yeah, it's like successor. Excalibur. Like yeah. only the one true king could wield right. Excalibur. So because but... he held the staff, everyone's oh, I guess he's Sorcerer Royal now. Yeah, because yeah. They, you can't really like take that power away from someone. Yeah. I mean, not like 
I mean, you have to do it in a very savage <laughs> way, which we'll talk about later. Yeah. But um, but Zacharias, he he's a former slave, right? So he, he was actually bought by Sir Stefan on like on a slave ship because yeah. he had magical uh, magical abilities, and he's like he's like, well. You know, why not? Why why don't I buy this black kid <laughs> with magical powers and see how far he'll go? It seems like Sir Stefan was always more of a progressive wizard, so maybe he he was looking for a way to prove that you know black men can just be as much a wizard as as white men. Mm-hmm. And here was his here was his chance. Yeah, here was right? his chance, but um I I mentioned at, at book club that how much I did not like Sir, Sir Stefan because <laughs> well, I really think he was a terrible person. But I think he's just like like you're like he was you know like kind of woke but not exactly. He's kind of like it's the same criticism we have like sometimes of, that people have of like some white allies, right? Like good intentions <laughs> but not great execution. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because Zacharias mentions um, mentions to Prunella, the other main lead in this book, how um, like he's always kind of wondered why like Sir Stefan didn't even bother to buy his parents. Yeah, like he didn't buy his parents, and also like when he was being raised, it almost felt like he he was more of a pet or a science experiment yeah. than like an actual son. But then um, one of our members brought up, like, counter-argument that, um, you know, like, Sir Stefan doesn't have a child. Like, Zacharias is his only yeah. son, only child, so it could just be that, like, he doesn't know how to be a good father. Well, and also just, I think this is an issue, and, like, I can't really speak to it personally because uh, I'm not adopted, but um, speaking with friends who are were adopted, um, there's always this, you know, this fear that you know if you don't like you're supposed to be appreciative of your adoptive parents no matter what and there's this like pressure to like you know for people to remind you of that like oh like if it weren't for your parents yeah and, and in this case you still be a slave and i think what was really interesting about just having um zacharias as a main character um in this era was that you get to see the world through his eyes and it really reminded me of um so I saw Get Out the other week. Oh, yeah. And just, like, being the only person of color in a world full where you're the only one, it's like you're always on your guard. And I think the author did a really good job of um, of writing or of portraying that, um, that tension or that constant, like, you have to be what you can't show what you're really thinking. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Like, Zacharias has very high moral ground. Like, he yeah. is definitely, like, I need to be the model minority. I need to make sure that I am perfect in everything because yeah. the burden of representation is on my shoulders. Yeah. And, you know, the very first chapter is his mother, well, after his after his uh, ascension to Sorcerer Royal, his first real social outing. Like, his mother takes him to a party of, like, a mutual friend who's, like, this really terrible like lady yeah and then he's like has a smile through all the unwanted attention all like the yeah people were snubbing him and also like like i i was just like baffled by some of the things that the character the other character said to to his face yeah they said in the nicest way possible oh we think you killed your dad (laughs) and like took the staff forcibly to become sorcerer royale yeah i mean that's just what other people are and saying. And it's like, okay. <laughs> his mother, his adopted mother was like surprised that people weren't accepting him. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, she was surprised because, um, like she was just like, Oh, like you should go out more. Like you're at an age where you should be like getting, thinking about getting married. Like why yeah. wouldn't, uh, like young respectable ladies not go after you. Like you're rich, you're handsome, you're intelligent. And just and, and like, his, and his wait. Mind is just like, yeah, I know exactly why. And it's you just know? like, wait, I think you're forgetting something. <laughs> mm, I'm black. Like, yeah. Yeah. And then like, he had the one friend who like, he literally helped get his job, but hates him for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's very, even without the whole race thing, it's very dangerous ground for, 
I actually have, uh, I wrote down a quote because I think it sums up uh, Zacharias's position mm -hmm. exactly. And this is uh, with him and uh, he, in the scene, he had just talked with Edgeworth and Edgeworth had just pretty much gone right. around his back. And, and Edgeworth is um, basically the, the wizards, I keep saying wizards, the, the unnatural philosophers liaison with the, the government, the government, the crown. Pretty so much. think yeah. Squib Draco Malfoy. That means nothing to me. <gasps> okay. I, I don't know what that means. It just means a non-magical Draco Malfoy who was like a complete daddy's boy and was just like, <laughs> just wait until my father hears about this because he's from like a magical family. Right, right. right. Um, but uh, here's the quote. Zacharias, with rather more success for his life, had been such as to cultivate his ability to feign complacence, even when he was, even when he was angriest. For all the privileges Sir Stephen's patronage had lent him, Zacharias could not often afford the liberty of honest emotion. Right. Yeah, because Edge, like in the scene, Edward is just like yelling at him, hmm. being like, "Why aren't you giving me magic? And why right. are you like messing up everything?" And Zacharias is just like, "I need to not." <laughs> blow up at the sky i need to like make yeah. sure my anger is in check because he knows privileges like he knows that edgeworth it's the it's the perspective you have as a minority or as someone who isn't of the privileged class to recognize all the places where you do not have it yeah right and that's you know in the real world that's what makes it so like difficult because you can't explain privilege to someone who has it because mm -hmm. I mean, you can't explain it but it's hard it's like i don't know yeah yeah, I mean, I thought it was also interesting that um, Zacharias he he mentions in like this very emotional um, kind of like speech mm -hmm. or rant. I guess Zacharias's version of a rant, rant because he never gets angry. <laughs> but uh, his little uh, speech to Pernella saying how he never wanted to study magic, like right. he like. Like he, like he was given an opportunity that other people would die for, right? And and it was just that he, his parents had certain expectations of him, and he knew that if he didn't meet those expectations, there was always like a chance where uh, he could just be out of a home and like, right? Yeah. So he's so he's just saying like, oh, I had to do this to survive. It's not because <laughs> I wanted to learn magic or I had like a passion for it it was literally it's a very it, it's it's definitely dramatized but it's definitely something that is relatable to anyone who's been marginalized or anyone who's like been in a situation where survival was like it's yeah it's it's more for survival than anything else it reminded me of um just like the general immigrant experience you're yeah. like brought into a culture that you're not familiar with but you just kind of have to swim yeah like you have to you just have to do it do whatever it takes to like survive and right so he wants to figure out um this magic problem right but yeah he doesn't have time and so when he's talking to his buddy, um, Damaro, who is kind of like his buddy. I mean, he's like his only friend, I would say. <laughs> like his only friend who happens to be like, like his magical ability is not that high. It's like not exceptional, but he... But he has a lot of friends. He has a lot of friends. Yeah. And also like he holds a very unique position. <laughs> like where he doesn't... He, isn't he a sorcerer, but he doesn't have a familiar... I'm not sure. I'm sorry. It's been a while since I finished this book, but <laughs> I do I do remember that his magical ability was not as exceptional as Zacharias, but people respected him and yeah. he was very popular with the ladies. He's he, so Damro is I guess a guy who just knows everybody. Yeah. And knows everything. He's kind of like there he says like Zacharias is essentially his spy master, right? Like yeah. a guy who goes around like Figures things out, finds out what's going on. Um, he like warns Zacharias about propaganda that's been like pretty much trying to incite violence against him. Yeah, and tells him like you should you should maybe go out of town for a while, wait till this boils over, mm -hmm. right? And so that's when um, an opportunity arises for him to go speak at a a gentle a women's school, yeah, yeah pretty like much. like a 
school for young women with magical abilities. Right. So that's where he meets Prunella. So do you want to talk about Prunella or do you... Um... Yeah, let's talk about Prunella because she is, I would say, arguably the second protagonist in this right. book. Um, so Prunella is an orphaned, biracial, half-white, half-Indian woman yeah. who is under the care of the headmistress of um, this magical school for young ladies. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when we say magical school for young ladies, it sounds like Hogwarts or like... It's more like a... It's, is charm school? Is that the right yeah, word Yeah, like or? charm school, finishing school, whatever yeah. it's called. But... Um, they're not going there to learn magic. They're actually going to the school for the opposite reason. They're yeah. going there to get rid of their magic. Yeah, to learn how to keep their magical urges. I yeah, guess magical urges in check. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she is pretty much like the assistant, um, the headmis- headmistress's ward yeah. and assistant who like takes care of her and... Like the the headmistress, like what was her name? Uh, Mrs. Dabani. Mm-hmm. She reminded me of uh, Mrs. Bennett from Pride and Prejudice. She who was did like have, over dramatic. I remember that character from the zombie movie. Yeah, she's yeah, just it's like over dramatic and like. She was uh, the mom, right? Yeah, she's the mom. Yeah, <laughs> like everything was. She's like contradictory. She'll, yeah, like she'll forget what she said like five seconds before <laughs> and like say like the most. And then she'll, like, faint to get out of things. Yeah, yeah. It's very Mrs. Bennett. Um, <laughs> but Prunella, like, that's, that's like, her guardian. Right. Um, and then she sees the Sorcerer Royal's visit as a chance to increase her station, you know, which is also a very Mrs. Bennett thing to do, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but Zacharias arrives at the school, and, you know, he expects... Like a normal school where yeah. you, where like the women are being taught spells to uh, kind of restrain their magic, but he doesn't realize how um, how brutal it yeah. is. Yeah. So I guess uh, Miss, Mrs. Debony Debony, um, the headmistress, has developed this new method of kind of of controlling the magical power with of her students, and it turns out it's basically a modified killing curse mm-hmm. it's a you know it's it's a curse meant it's a spell meant to murder someone but like with like some not as much you know with a little yeah. bit lighter like with a little they, bit, like, it's, like tinkered di- it a yeah. little bit to like make them like paralyze and yeah. have seizures <laughs> but the magic is essentially drained from their body and and, and it goes back into the atmosphere mm-hmm. which is kind of like recycling magic right. into back into England and I thought that was like really uh, so like, that's something cr- that yeah. yeah that's something we didn't um, mention before was uh, magic in this world is a finite resource that's why when it's being depleted um, that's what we meant that's why it's a bad thing because there's only so many so much magic that's being allowed in that everyone I guess everyone shares from mm-hmm. right so um, that's another reason why they don't want women to use magic because it's wasting the magic yeah, like I mean the the snobby white nobles, their their reasons like, oh, we don't need women doing like beauty glamours or yeah. like or like cooking spells. That's like wasting our resources. But you see in a scene where like the thaumaturges are like in the dining hall and they're doing pretty much prank magic. They're making fireworks. And, and I'm I'm just yeah. like, wait, what is that? That's, that's like a total waste of resources. There was um yeah, they were <laughs> they they're conjuring mirror images of themselves reading like poetry about themselves or something. Yeah. It's like super... Like super frat boy magic, <laughs> like magic uh, yeah. experiments. And it's, it was just like, what? Like you're literally killing, like half killing these girls and and like these, and like the men get to like play with their fireworks. That's totally unfair. I mean, it, it it's perfectly in line with the... Uh, I know. The I social know. It just made me, it, it made me emotionally like... I was just like, what? Um, <laughs> but then, so during his visit, he sees, basically he walks in the classroom while all the girls are having a fight. And he sees the you know, one girl throwing like, like offensive magic towards Prunella and Prunella like effortlessly like defending and deflecting and like, mm-hmm. like basically like one hand blocking spells, the other hand like trying to help another girl with another spell. Yeah. And then 
to him, well, first he realizes he sees that. I, I, I'm assuming this is where he falls in love with Pernella. I don't. I think it's gradual, but yeah, like I would say he's. <laughs> the author does make a point to mention that he thinks he's she's like pretty. Yeah, she's right? pretty. Yeah, um, and he's also impressed by her you no know, magic, and then that's where he where he also comes to the realization that oh wait, maybe girls can just be as much be good at magic can be as good at magic as men. Yeah, right. That's where he comes. He has this epiphany, and so. I mean, he kind of becomes his dad, and he wants to, like, prove to the world that women can be equal. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so Prunella is pretty much his muse for this project, because <laughs> he wants to, like, make a school for women. Yeah, he wants to reform women's education. He starts getting into, like... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just want to get to, like, Zacharias and Prunella um, and their relationship yeah. with each other, because they have a very, <laughs> they have a very unique relationship. Right. Um, so Zacharias, he's like super excited to have Prunella be his little like project. Yeah. And he's just like, oh, I'm going to like give you all these resources and I'm going to teach you all like all of these, uh, yeah, all of these spells and Prunella, Prunella just wants to get out of her life and like kind of take control. And then, um, she, you know, during the course of, um, preparing for Zacharias' arrival, she finds like, uh, a bag that her dad had left that contained that contains familiar eggs Mm -hmm. right and these are all very very valuable because um like like magic is depleted in england and familiars provide magic because because they're fairy creatures (laughs) and also you're only legally allowed to have one familiar so she has seven and she's a woman yeah so there's a problem right there. Um, but she, you know, I guess being of the independent mind, so she's like the, the, the Jane Austen heroine, right? She, like, wants oh, yeah. to, like, set on her own terms, like, live on her own terms. Oh, she's, like, unscrup- unscrupulous. Like, she's just <laughs> like, I will do whatever it takes to get what I want. Right. Even if it means that I will, like, harm other people. Right. And so, um, I guess he, she... Decides to tag along if Zacharias promises her to find her, to like introduce her to society and find her husband. Yeah. And then in return, she will be tutored under him. Like, yeah, she will will allow him to teach her magic. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Even though it's very clear that she has way more, like, she knows how to magic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, Zacharias is all about like books and formulas and like the science behind magic. And And she's like freestyling. Yeah. And Pernell is just like, uh, I don't need to learn. I don't, I don't need to read these books. (laughs) I like already know how to like conjure magic. It's interesting. Did you find it interesting about how spells are like explained in this book? It's kind of nerdy. It's like math and formulas and like, okay, if you add this concept with this concept, you can create this new thing. Or using, you know, like yeah. Solomon's arrow or other like, it, like like I said at the beginning of the this episode, it's very much alchemy yeah. more than like <laughs> like magic from like a wand. Yeah. Um But yeah, like Prunella is very so, much not interested. Yeah. So in that sense, Prunella's kinda like a prodigy, right? She can like Yeah, I mean, like, it it makes sense, at least uh, in the story, that Prunella would be the one who is more magically adept than Zacharias. Because Zacharias, uh, even though he's, you know, black, and he faces a lot of microaggressions in his daily life, he's still a man of means. Like, he (laughs) has rich adoptive parents. Like, he has a very powerful position, even if people don't respect him for it. Right. Whereas, like, Prunella, she's an orphan. She has no family connections. She has no money. So the only way that she can be on equal footing with Zacharias is in terms of magical ability. Right. And we find out when she hatches three of her familiar eggs (laughs) that uh, women are actually quite, like, prone to... to Right. So this was a part that was really, like, I was surprised that the book went there. But then it, I was delighted that the book went there. <laughs> so the the concept is so um familiars they're like your like they're like sorcerers pets, right? They 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 do their bidding, they're kind of loyal and they provide their their masters with 
uh, magic and assistance. Um, but in order to um, to tame them, you have to pretty much offer up blood. Mm-hmm. Like you, you know, you offer up blood in the beginning to to get them on your side. You know, most, and then at the end of your life, you pretty much like they eat your soul. Yeah, right. That's kind of the deal. And then <laughs> the um, um, so there's this Malaysian witch character, pretty, pretty much Mark like, Gengar. Yeah, the um, the head of the Malaysian witches that were like that the British government wants to arrest a bomb. Um, she comes to England to exact her revenge against like the Sheik ruler of her country, and then she kind of becomes um, Prunella's other mentor in like the the more like devious sides of magic. Mm-hmm. And she pretty much hints at like, yeah, women are like way more equipped to offer blood for the familiars. <laughs> period magic. <laughs> Let's just say it. Period magic. Um, yeah, I was really. Like, I had to read that part a couple times because I was like, wait, <laughs> did it go there? Oh, it actually went yeah. there. Because, like, Zacharias is, like, at, it's very subtle in He's the working book. through it, and he's like, oh, his, like, his knowledge of human biology. <laughs> I mean, like, he, he he's just like, wait, how did you, like, get three familiars on your side? They require a lot of blood. Like, did you cut yourself? Like, like are you okay? And she's yeah. just like, let's, she's like, Zacharias, like, I'm okay. Let's just not go there. And he's just like, wait, like, why? Like, I'm really curious. And and she goes like, you shouldn't ask a woman these things. And that's when it clicks in his brain. And he's like, oh, period magic. Um, yeah, I I was actually really uh, happy that I, that I saw that. It was gross. But, but I was really happy to read that because, um, like, like in in history like women's periods have kind of been something that um was seen as disgusting and women should like isolate themselves from men yeah. like they're unclean whereas um yeah in like the scene like period can be something powerful it's you know it's biological it you like <laughs> there's nothing wrong with it it's it's the course of nature and um and it was just like really it was like a really fresh take on like yeah. how women can kind of uh, be seen as powerful beings. So I guess that's like the whole second half of this book is kind of Prunella coming to her own in British society, um, kind of making her own terms, right? She becomes angry that people are trying to kill Zacharias, so she tries to, you know, protect him take matters in her own her own hands Mm -hmm. um she kind of goes on like spy adventures not so much spy adventures i feel like she finds out information like accidentally yeah um zacharias finally figures out why there's no magic in england yeah and it turns out to be because uh, fairyland decided to block them because england's being a dick to malaysia yeah, um, right. so the, what, what, what were they called? The Lamiers? The Lamias. Or, the Lamias, yeah. yeah. So pretty much uh, Mediterranean vampires. I think that's what they are. They're vampires. Yeah. Um, they they are living in Malaysia, and apparently they're causing trouble because they're encouraging women to have, to like use magic. Yeah. Um, and because the British are... Have interest there. Have interest in that land. Um, <clears throat> the the Lami the Lamiers, they're like, okay, we're gonna block magic in, in <laughs> the, the magic to England because yeah. until England backs off. Right. But the problem is the Lamiers did not tell any British military folks or anyone that that's what's happening that's what's happening so they pretty um, much blackmailed without but it was <laughs> funny that um basically the reason the, the the way they were able to get the king to the fairy king to block the magic is to threaten them like well if the british come and drive us from our new home we're gonna have to move back to your place and the fairy king's like, uh-uh, you guys are gross. <laughs> you guys leave blood everywhere. You guys smell bad. I don't want you here. <laughs> so he's like, okay, let's, let's just send the magic from magic yeah. to England to other countries. I will appreciate it more. And it's funny just because it's such a, it's another very, like, reach the era British, like, like 
thing. It's just, oh, it's not anything bad or anything serious. It's not because of like a threat to the world or anything. It's just because a family disputes. Like it's just because he doesn't want his relatives to live with them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this book is a lot funnier than I thought it would be. It's definitely, <laughs> it's definitely a romp. Like, it, yeah. Like it's it's a romantic comedy mixed in with a lot of uh, yeah, a, a lot of magic and action adventure. Um, but la 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 la. Okay, I'm trying to think where do you go from here. Um. Um. Well, I mean. I do want to talk. I, I do want to compare like Zacharias and yeah. Prunella, um, on how like race, gender, and class. Yeah, really. I feel like Prunella gets away with a lot more things than Zacharias because she's a woman, and because she's a woman of color, she's exoticized because it's easier to be a trophy wife than. Maybe I also think that she's also not as much in her own head as Zacharias is. I think Zacharias, like as a person in the position of power, could have easily been more brash too. But he's, you know, he's the way he was brought up. He was very, you know, he's trained to like observe and react. Yeah, he was trained to please. Yeah, whereas uh, Prunella, being like full orphan, I guess, um, didn't really like. Well, no. Well, well I guess I guess Prunella um, is always more of a. She's characterized as more impulsive, more like she wants to do what's right for her, right? Yeah, what, I w- what feels right to her. I, I mean. would say that Zacharias, like with him having adoptive parents, like it definitely plays into his character because mm-hmm. it's definitely like I said, burden of representation is on his shoulders, and he's right. like, I need to do well. I need to. I need to succeed. Whereas with Prunella, she doesn't have any parental figures that she needs to please. And she's she's all about like, well, people are going to say bad things about <laughs> me anyway because of my gender or right. like my, my color. So I'm just going to do what I want. And yeah. whereas like Zacharias, he's always like, oh, I need to, I need to like be nice. I need to have other people like me in order to have respect. Right. Whereas with Prunella, she's like, you're going to respect me no matter what. <laughs> like, I am demanding it. Yeah. Like, there's, like, no uh, tiptoeing around her. Yeah. And, you know, I can, see what you, I can see what you mean when you say that she does have some advantages as a woman because no one expects, like, certain things from her or people assume things about her. Yeah, she has, right. she has more latitude. Yeah. And... Whereas Zacharias, like his race is like actively being used against him. Like her race is typically like it seems like it's people were rationalizing it, right? Well, like the reason like like how she got into high society is pretty much lying, saying that like, oh, my dad was like a rich white nobleman who traveled to India and like happened to get a lady pregnant and that's me. <laughs> Um, and people were like, oh, you know, even though she's half, you know, like half Indian, she's still a gentlewoman because of her dad and because she has money, it's okay. And that's why everyone's treating her, um, so fairly. And there, there, there are like men chasing after her because they think that she has a fortune. She has a lineage. Yeah. Whereas with like Zacharias, (laughs) I mean, he has the wealth, he has the title. It's just. People aren't going to gain anything from that. Yeah, they probably would lose more. Yeah. Right. And with like Prunella, because she's a woman, they're like, well, everything she owns, I own. <laughs> so it, it, it's she's less of a threat when it comes to male authority right. in England. Which is funny because eventually it, it does get revealed that her father was disowned by his family and she actually owns nothing. But then you find out that her mother was actually the, the like really really powerful one. Yeah, like here. the sorceress of India with like ten familiar eggs. <laughs> um, yeah, but Prunella, like during one of her uh, social outings, she finds out that the society of thermaturges they're they're conspiring against Zach. Yeah, they're going to throw a crew. Like they're in the most like yeah like so we mentioned that the staff chooses its, its owner. 
And the only way to um, forcefully transfer that is to literally infuse the blood of the current owner into the person you want to transfer it to. So cut them open, bleed them dry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like British rituals. Yeah. Very civil. And it's been outlawed, but then they were able to, you know, re reinstate it because of, I don't know, wizard parliament, probably. Yeah. Well, it seemed like they didn't really do it in a legal manner mm. either. Yeah. But it was just like a way... I mean, the reason why they're able to go through with it is because, uh, uh, because a a magician, Jeffrey Midsummer, yeah, he returns with the familiar, yeah, and now he's a sorcerer, and because there's another sorcerer, they're like, oh, he has a familiar, and he's white, and he's white, so... and he's rich. Why don't we make him sorcerer <laughs> royale yeah. and find a way to like get rid of Zacharias? Yeah, yeah. And so, <laughs> and like Prunella, she's at she's yeah. she just happens to be at this party because like her uh, like her girlfriend like was dragged there. Yeah, and um, and she like re- like pretty much she thinks that um, Jeffrey Midsummer is the one who is attempting assassination. Yeah, attempts uh, against yeah, against Zach- Zacharias. Yeah, and then but then you find out that it's actually his familiar, who's also his wife. Yeah, super weird. He's been passing her off as his wife, who's, I guess, was she a siren or a mermaid? Like, what was her? She was a sea monster. <laughs> I don't know. She, like, she was like a giant mermaid. Yeah. Um, and so, and then you find out she's trying to kill Zacharias because she thinks that he, because remember, everyone thinks that he killed his father and stole his power. Um, and because they haven't seen his father's um, familiar, Leofric. Um, Leofric, who was a dragon, they assumed that he killed Leofric as well. And so that rumor made it back to Fairyland. And so she wants, I guess she used to be engaged to Leofric. Yeah. Um, before, like, before he left to become a familiar. Mm-hmm. And so she's like, I must, like, for my, uh, for my beloved honor, beloved's honor, I must murder you. Yeah. And then, so the scene is set. This is my favorite part. One of my favorite parts because, like, the scene is set for a huge, like, wizard battle. Right, you have this giant sea monster threatening to pretty much destroy the whole entire city of London with like giant waves and yeah, and um and instead, what do the heroes do? They bring in the sea monster's aunt, who is, I guess, um or the sea monster's cousin, yeah, who is the aunt of one of their friends who turns out to be a dragon in human form. He's like a really lazy like. Youngest son of this noble dragon family. He just wants to hang out with humans all day. And then she comes and pretty much like, instead of like a final wizard battle, it's just her like sassing the monster. She's just like, you didn't love Leo Freak anyway. You're just doing this to cause trouble. And like, (laughs) Like you didn't love him until you left. You like broke out the engagement. It's a lot of sass. Yeah. It's it's very much like a battle of wits than an actual battle, which I appreciated (laughs) because it was like a fun twist, like a fun turning point. Right. Um, But yeah, like Zacharias reveals that he didn't kill his father. Basically, his father passed away from being like, from heart disease, pretty much. Yeah. And that he, in in an effort to stop Leofric from eating his father's soul, because that was a deal as his familiar, he agreed to offer him his soul while he was living. Yeah. But Leo Frick was like, well, I only, I only make contracts with Sorcerer Royales, like yeah. only the best of the best for me. So you <laughs> have to be Sorcerer Royale in order to have a contract with me. Yeah. So that's, that's how he became Sorcerer Royale. Yes. He didn't really do it because he wanted to. It's kind of, he wanted to save his, he wanted to save his dad. dad. Slice of thought of dad. But I, I was really confused by that, right? Because cause it just seems like his relationship with Stefan was so strained. strained. Yeah. And and it's just like, well, like you felt like you owed your entire life to this man and he died naturally. So it's <laughs> like I don't see like why you would go the extra mile to save his soul while like putting yours at at risk. I mean, something that you find out about Zacharias, though, is like he does care about his friends, right? And I, I don't know. I feel like in that situation, 
he probably it's probably like a rash a rash it was decision, like a very right? impulsive like, oh no decision. my dad don't eat him well do you think it's because um like that feeling of of like oh i owe everything to my white adoptive parents like do you think that's like so ingrained in him that like that was just like his impulse like oh i need to like save my dad it probably had a lot to do with it i mean he was the only father figure he had the only person who like who like besides his adopted mother who seems to like truthfully love him or like him at the very least you know he Mm -hmm. like he didn't really have that many friends right i mean I see it almost, I mean, I, I, I don't really understand how it went from there, but, <laughs> but I, I do kind of see the reasons why he would make that contract with Leo Frick, because it's kind of like a way for him to survive. Yeah. Because like with Sir Stefan, once his soul is saved, he becomes a ghost. Yeah. And like he still has guidance from his dad. Right. That's something we didn't mention is that um, the, throughout the entire story, um, Zacharias has a ghost buddy, his his ghost dad, his ghost dad, has who, been riding around and he's like around him and gives him like unsolicited advice. It's like the racist, like racist, sexist grandpa. You know, <laughs> it's just like, why are you trying to build a school for women witches? Like that's such a waste of time and energy. And he's just like, but then he gets into it. I, I feel like I feel like ghost dad. Did grow while he was traveling with Zacharias. Yeah, yeah. a little, a little. <laughs> um, Let's talk about the end because I like holy crap! Like last fifty pages of this book <laughs> shocked me. <clears throat> After the 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 big brouhaha with the sea monster, there's a couple of revelations. It's revealed that uh, Prunella has been practicing magic mm-hmm. and is not actually a noble woman. And she has three familiars. She has three familiars. It's revealed that Zacharias has Leofric within him and slowly killing him. And it's revealed that um, basically, um, I guess, Midsummer, the guy who's trying to stage a coup, is like full of shit. Yeah, he's full of shit. And right. it, it wasn't him. It was his wife yeah. slash familiar who was causing a lot of trouble for Zacharias. Right. And they also learn about why magic is has been so low in England, and yeah. it's, it has nothing to do with Zacharias. So they lose pretty much all grounds <laughs> to do the whole, uh, whole like, yeah. blood sacrifice ritual in order to transfer power into uh, right. Mid- Jeffrey Summers, and uh, Jeffrey Midsummer. I guess, like, Zacharias is pretty much off the hook, but, they re- but he realizes that um, Prunella is now in danger because she is, like, she broke the law, right, pretty much. Yeah. So he comes up with this scheme to to make sure that she's protected, and that is to make her the new Sorcerer Royal. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say at this at this point, Zacharias is at his most politician. <laughs> like, like he makes a deal with uh, Jeffrey Midsummer and his uh, and his family, who's yeah. also part of the society, and he's just like, okay, well, one. You get rid of the blood sacrifice thing, and I won't do anything uh, yeah. to to Jeffrey Midsummer. I will make sure that he still has a job and and like whatnot. But you guys have to vote yes to everything yeah. that I like propose. And they're like, fine, like we'll we'll do that. <laughs> and then so so like they have like kind of like a Congress meeting yeah. of the society members and. Uh, they announced, oh, we can't do the blood sacrifice thing because, one, it was not constitutional. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and two, uh, we lost the reason. We lost grounds to do that to Zacharias right. because of revelations. And then the second thing that Zacharias proposes in this Congress meeting is like, oh, I'm going to make a school for women witches and you guys are going to fund it. And they're like, OK, fine, fine, we'll do it. <laughs> And then, and then they're like, oh, is this meeting over now? No, like, one more thing. And he's like, oh, one more thing. And then he throws his staff to Prunella, who catches it. <laughs> and he's like, I'm retired. What are you going <laughs> to do? <laughs> like, what are you going to do now? Prunella is now Sorcerer Royal. Yeah. The staff chose her, obviously, because she has three familiars. Yeah. And is way more sorcerer than anyone else in this room. And, uh... And, and of of course, like there's the whole problem with Leo Frick still living inside yeah. him and eating his soul while he's still alive. Well, I mean, 
let's talk about the reason why he gave it to Pernellos because, and you know the the Sorcerer Royal is immune to any pretty much crimes. Yeah. So she can't be tried or found guilty, or she can't be punished for practicing magic as a woman or having three familiars. Yeah, and she can also, uh, you know, be independent. Yeah. Yeah, because she gets money. <laughs> right, and so everything is solved except for the the little fact that Leo Frick stole killing him from inside. Mm-hmm. So once she has, so. It's it's the same scene, right? She decides to like do something about that too, and she's like, "Hey, Leofric, come out!" And she pulls Leofric literally out of Zacharias's mouth, yeah, and says, "I want you to make a deal with me." And he and Leofric's just like, "Oh my god, I'm so tired of making deals <laughs> over this thing that's supposed to be like like a standard contract between familiar and sorcerer." And she's like, "What if I gave you?" something better than a Sorcerer Royale's soul. And what does she do? <laughs> yeah. She throw she grabs one of her familiars, Nidget, the The Elvet. The Elvet. Yeah. And she throws Nidget at Leofric and Leofric swallows Nidget whole. Mm-hmm. So she pretty much um sacrificed her baby. Because yeah. familiars are like your children. At least these ones, because she hatched them. Yeah, she hatched them. With her period blood. Yeah. And everyone is horrified. Yeah. Well, because just getting one familiar is like a lifetime's work. Mm -hmm. And she willingly, willingly, like, threw away, like, what could probably be like a third of her power. Yeah. there. And everyone's just like, holy crap, she is ruthless. And no one ever, like... Yeah. Like after after that moment it's just like, okay, you're sorcerer royale, we won't do anything yeah. because um you're crazy. <laughs> so it's interesting and that's this is something you brought up actually, um, when we were talking about this before was that it's kind of like you know how we talk so we, we mentioned that um Zacharias is pretty much like Wizard Obama mm-hmm. and then Prunella kind of becomes Wizard Hillary in the sense where she's you know, she did something ruthless and everyone like Oh my god, she's like so like so, so cut through. So cut through about it. When just like a week ago they wanted to cut Zacharias open and take all his blood. Yeah. You know? So and also like, these men probably own slaves. So I'm just <laughs> like, they're not great people. Right. So, you know, it's 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 one of those things where like, you know, when when a woman does it, when when a black man does it, it's like the worst thing ever. Yeah. But when they do it, oh it's fine. Yeah, it's oh, it's yeah. fine. And then, like, when a woman does it, it's just like, oh, snap. <laughs> it's like boss versus bossy. Yeah. And, um, but I mean, so she succeeds in pretty much, um, getting Lear Frick off of Zacharias's back. Yeah. Um, while also, <laughs> like, cementing her pretty much her power over the, the, the Wizard Congress. Yeah. And, and, and and the thing is, Prunella is much more um, much more capable of doing in, the job of doing the job than Zach- Zacharias because yeah. Prunella doesn't care at all. She's just <laughs> like you're going to pass this bill, rather, like regardless of like what you think about me. Whereas Zacharias is very much more. Um, he wants to get you know. He wants to. I don't even know if he wants consensus, but he wants to kind of not make waves i would say right. zacharias is more of a politician than prunella mm-hmm. but she's a maverick right yeah <laughs> like prunella like knows what she's doing um yeah but at the very very end of the novel zacharias you know he's free from his responsibilities yeah so he, he goes becomes a magical farmer yeah a magical gardener yeah, yeah. and we finally get to the one like romance scene in the, the entire book <laughs> Which is like the last chapter. <laughs> I dig it. Yeah. So basically, basically they get they decide to get married. Yeah. It's, like it's pr- very it's a very brutish like courtship. Like, are you asking me to marry you, or do you want me to ask you to marry you? It's it, yeah. It's very like Austin esque of yeah. like there's like miscommunication. Yeah. And and she's just like, well, no one's gonna marry me now because everyone's scared of me, yeah. and I have no money, even though I have power. So. 
I guess, like, I'll just settle for a guy who thinks I'm pretty and will <laughs> let me do my job and leave me alone in peace. And he's like, hey, I still have money and I think you're pretty. <laughs> we should get married. And she's just like, is this a joke? And he's like, no, I like we should get married. And they're like, OK, let's let's do that. And that's yeah. pretty much the proposal. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Well, it's because, you know, even throughout the story, it's like the author establishes that she does like him. Like, I think pretty early, like in the first, like at the end of the first act, like she decides that she likes him a lot. Yeah. And that's why she wants to like protect him from the assassins. Right. Yeah. And, and even it's also, it's for, also the same for Zacharias. Like it's yeah. very clear that he likes her. Cause, uh, even though she's like, even though he's helping her look for a rich husband mm-hmm. and she's like a rich husband, like it's, it's a very is that an Austin thing or is that just like I don't know it's just like <laughs> it's just like a romance novel thing <laughs> but yeah so at the end of the book there's a new status quo um, there's a new sorcerer royal Prunella reigns over the Britain the British magical scene and it's established that she is very good at it yeah she's very good at it and um, you know magic is magic is now back in england like it's not depleted like they have and you know now there's going to be a school for women witches yeah so a lot of things have changed from the beginning of the novel yeah to to the end and it makes me question what's going to happen in the second novel right so this is i guess going to be a trilogy yeah from from what i hear at least yeah and then is what she's slowly working on the second book yeah, I mean, Zencho is a, like, she's a corporate lawyer and oh. novelist by night, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, she's she's pretty busy, but she's always writing. That's good. I'm, I'm excited to see what the next step is. I want to see more of um, the world. You know, I want to see more. Uh, I mean, the next conflict is has got to be something to do with the with French, Napoleon. Right? Napoleon yeah. right? I mean, one thing I really appreciated about Source of Her Crown was... Um, like a lot of fantasy fantasy novel fantasy novels that take place during a colonial period, they won't include people of color, right? Mm-hmm. But she kind of went above and beyond. She yeah. didn't just include people of color; she made them protagonists, and she yeah. also didn't make it like a colorblind casting. She very much made race and gender yeah. it's like, like a central issue, a central issue yeah. that um, kind of shaped her characters. So this book really surprised me in in a lot of ways um and i guess like with with the sequel and and like the subsequent books that are going to come out um i guess what i would like to see more is uh i guess i guess like more 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 of the other cultures because we are going yeah like more into like i want to know how the french sorciers yeah work (laughs) And even maybe like the American sorcerers, you know. I mean, would would they have sorcerers in America, considering like Puritans and? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I don't maybe know. the natives, you know. But it it really did make me appreciate like um, how race, culture, gen- race, culture, gender, um, all kind of shape all of the characters. Yeah, and how it can enhance a story that you know is already interesting um, on its on its face. But you add these extra dimensions and it's like even more interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's something that I, I mean, we, we talked about it in our Harry Potter episode and I'm just like, this is what I wanted from Fantastic, Fantastic Beasts. I wanted to see how magic and state affairs work. Yeah. I wanted to see how uh, race affects, like, of, affects class and how other people treat, <laughs> like, treat each other. It's like, it, it would have been yeah. more interesting um if harry potter had done that yeah but you know different time different book different Sorry, author i was saying good job john cho you wrote a better story than <laughs> jk rowling <laughs> um bottom line we, we we both really liked this book and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next one whenever it comes out um, and hope you guys did too. If you guys have anything to add to the discussion, again, please go to our Goodreads page. There is a forum um, thread going um, and let us know what you think about Sorcerer to the Crown. Please, we, we'd love to hear from you. 
And on that note, let's um, do you want to talk about what are what we're reading next month or this month, I guess? Yeah, this month. <laughs> so our schedule's been a little bit messed up, but uh, we'll we'll get there. We'll fix it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but for the month of March, we will be reading "When Breath Becomes Air" by Paul Kalanisi. And it's a memoir. It's our first nonfiction book in, in book club. And it's pretty much a memoir written by a neurosurgeon who was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Oh. So the book kind of is half autobiography and half like reflections on his reflections on medicine and illness and what it means to be alive and i heard from some people that it's very inspiring and uplifting and then other people said it was very depressing so we'll see i mean i'll venture to say it's probably a little bit both yeah probably (laughs) but yeah it's um when breath becomes air you can get that at your local library on kindle at amazon or your local bookstore so um check it out read it um we'll be discussing that at the end of march or early april (laughs) We'll figure it out. We'll check figure out it out. The, check out the Books and Boba Facebook page for our event listings. Um, are we going to try doing a Google Hangout again? Yeah, we're doing a Google Hangout again. Yeah, so we're going to have a Google Hangout for those of you not in the LA area. And for those of you in the LA area, um, and for those of you in the LA area, we will have an in-person meetup to discuss the book. So, um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that'll do it for this episode of um, Books and Boba. Hope you liked our discussion of Sorcerer to the Crown by Zen Cho. Thanks for listening. We'll, we'll talk to you next time. Bye. This episode of Books and Boba was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu and produced and edited by Marvin Yue. For further discussion on the books covered at Books and Boba, please visit our Goodreads forum. You can find the link on our Facebook page at Books and Boba, as well as by searching for the group Books and Boba on Goodreads.com. Books and Boba is also a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective a brand new collective of Asian American podcasts and podcasters. You can learn more about the collective as well as check out our founding slate of programs by visiting the website www.podcastpotluck.com. Podcast Potluck.